mahalo for inviting me here. Um, I want to start for, and thank you, Sherry, for moderating, facilitating. I want to start first because I wear many hats and I was asked to come here representing Ililani Media. So I want to explain what the difference is between that and my other work. I advocate in a num for a number of different organizations, but my media work, I try to be as neutral as possible while being as controversial as possible. <laughs> to think outside of the box, to bring together ideas from many different sectors. I've been blogging for close to a decade and in September of 2013, I interviewed Lorraine Akiba, one of the three commissioners on the Public Utilities Commission. And I took that around to a couple of places to ask them if they would publish it, and I was told no. So that's when I decided to do my Ililani Media full-time, daily basis, primarily on energy, primarily on state issues. And a lot of people commented, well, I can't figure out what your position is. The purpose of the media work was to get out ideas and not to take positions. So I interviewed Jose Dizan from Paniolo Power. Where are you? Over there. Um, I've interviewed people inside Hawaiian Electric, and I've sought to expand knowledge. Um, I think to any conversation on energy has to start with Einstein. He said E equals MC squared, which said that energy and matter are the same thing. And neither can be created, neither can be destroyed. They can only change forms. So if everything in the universe is energy or matter, and mankind has been able to change matter into energy and energy into matter, if it always exists and it's never different, how can anything be renewable? How can you have renewable energy? In science, you can't. <coughs> Only in politics can you have renewable energy. <laughs> and if you go to Hawaii or Pennsylvania or Ohio or New York or the US or China or Hungary, they all know what renewable energy is and they all think of something different. In fact, if you look just in Hawaii in 2000, 2002, 2006, 2010, and 2015, we have five different definitions of renewable energy. And when we passed, when we signed the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, we had forgotten to define clean energy. So basically, it's a lot of different things. So rather than take a word like renewable energy or clean energy or sustainability or democracy, which are sort of very nice sounding words that mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, we should focus on what the traits or characteristics that we're looking for are. Some people say what we need is low cost electricity. And mind you, they mean low cost electricity that you get into your wall socket which is like 40 or 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Back 20 years ago, the flash bulb in your light camera cost $2,000 a kilowatt hour, but you still wanted to take pictures at night, so you were willing to pay more for different uses. Some people want low cost, some people want high reliability, some people want efficiency, some people want local jobs, some people want local union jobs, some people want economic diversity, some people want to promote indigenous companies or indigenous fuels. There are many different things that people strive for. And whether you go for HECO or whether you go for Next Era is dependent upon what, does, what traits you desire. And at Ely Lenny Media, we seek not to tell you which way to go, but rather to say, these are the different options, these are the different issues, and you need to make up your own mind on that. Now, one of the interesting things that's going on right now is there are two major proceedings at the Public Utilities Commission. Two. They're the most complicated procedure they've ever done. 
and the second most complicated procedure they've ever done. And they're happening simultaneously. One of them is the merger proceeding. The other is figuring out how the heck you add on all this intermittent wind and intermittent solar and all this rooftop solar and how you make it fair for people who have rooftop solar and how you make it fair for people who want rooftop solar and how you make it fair for people who don't want rooftop solar. So there's this open proceeding, and I mean it is complex because we're meeting two to four times a week, maybe 12, 15 parties. And the PUC has said, we have till the end of June to come up with a short-term strategy, and then we can spend a year and a half making sure we get it right for a long-term strategy. And so this distributed energy resource proceeding is saying it doesn't matter whether HECO stays independent or whether NextEra takes them over. Either way, we have to figure out how to increase the amount of renewable energy we have in this state. So one of, one of the issues also that I find interesting is if you look at HELCO, and Jay said they're now at 47% renewable. You look at Florida Power and Light, and they're at 1% renewable. You look at this island, and 12% of all customers have rooftop solar. And you look at Florida Power and Light, and 7 one hundredths of 1% have rooftop solar. You look at this state, which has great energy efficiency and is rapidly <coughs> increasing it, and you look at Florida Power and Light, which has succeeded in getting their public service commission to drastically cut the amount of energy efficiency that's needed, and you say, why would they be a good fit? What I've heard is they have money and they're bigger. Now, of course, Honolulu has more money than Hawaii County, and they're bigger, so maybe this county should merge with Honolulu. Just kidding. So bigger is not always the way to go. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean you shouldn't go that way. Florida Power and Light has a smart grid. We don't. Florida Power and Light has smart meters. We have a few pilot projects going on. We don't have them. Florida Power and Light knows how to get federal money. They are, in fact, have been rated as one of the top companies in the United States for minimizing their income taxes. They pay less than 2% on taxes. Can you imagine if you each want to pay just 2% to the federal and state government, whether you could get away with that? So they know how to get money. They have fantastic lobbyists. They pull in a lot and they might be able to make things better here. The proceeding has like, I don't know, 15, 20,000 pages of documents, and that's just the public version. We also have access to confidential and confidential and restricted, which is more restrictive than confidential. Uh, in other words, some of the interveners are competitors to Hawaiian Electric. And therefore, they're allowed to see certain documents under seal, but they're not allowed to see other documents. So where we are in the proceeding right now, there's about seven steps in. You can break down the PUC process into seven steps. The first step was called Project Oracle, which is when Florida Power and Light decided on their board that they were going to try to buy Hawaiian Electric. And then they met with Hawaiian Electric. And whether Hawaiian Electric accepted or rejected their initial bid, we can't say, because that's not public. But eventually, Hawaiian Electric and NextEra came to terms. And that was all under Project Oracle. That was Florida Power and Light's code name for acquiring HECO. The second phase of the seven is when it was made public. And under federal law, there's like a 30 to 60 day cooling off period 
where all the documents have to be filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, but no action can, can be taken so people can begin reflecting on what's going on. The third phase is where the docket is opened and you have all the skirmishes on who can intervene, 29 parties filed to intervene, Next Era objected to two-thirds or three-quarters of them. Um, the consumer advocate from the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs is not considered an intervener because they're automatically a party in every proceeding. One of the last parties to intervene was the Department of Defense, which actually missed the deadline to intervene by a month, and then said, whoops, can we come in? And the Public Utilities Commission said, you know, we have every right to just say no, but what the heck, come in. So we have 29 parties. And, and to be fair, it wasn't just DOD that missed. The Honolulu Board of Water Supply missed by one day. Um, and so there were a few other things like that. Then you have skirmishes over protective orders, what it should look like, how a confidentiality agreement should look like, what the steps of the docket should look like. So that's all in phase three. And what was decided is what should be done up through the end of September. That is the first step. The Public Utilities Commission said, we're going to divide this into two phases. Phase one, we're going to publish and tell you what it is. Phase two, we don't know yet. So the, we're in now the fourth step, which is that we get to ask all sorts of questions to HECO and to Next Era. We can ask them to HECO or to Next Era or to both. They have to answer them and they have to answer within two weeks, but they're allowed to file all kinds of objections. And indeed, they file pages and pages of objections, preserving their right for a future legal battle, I suppose. So on July 20th, the 29 parties have to file their testimony and exhibits. Then next year and HECO get to fire off questions to us that we also have two weeks to get back to them on. The consumer advocate files their testimony on August 10th. Then HECO and next year file their rebuttal testimony on August 31st. At that point, the docket would be 20, 30, 40,000 pages long and the PUC has said they will come out for public hearings. At that point, we enter, eventually, the Public Utilities Commission has to figure out how to hold a hearing on this among the parties. HECO, MECO, HELCO, Next Era, the Consumer Advocate, 29 parties, contest case proceeding, the right to cross-examine each other, at one time, the PUC thought they could restrict it to two weeks. Then they thought maybe 15 days made more sense. We suspected it would be more like six weeks, but it will be something like that. There'll be a hearing process. And originally, Next Era wanted the whole thing wrapped up by December. The PUC is saying, no, June is more likely target date, and that it has a reason for it. When the PUC makes their final ruling, they can go one of three ways. They can say no, yes, or conditionally yes. And if they go conditionally yes, Next Era can say yes, no, or why don't you reconsider? They can also appeal. And any one of the interveners and the consumer advocate also have the right to appeal. Now, the Supreme Court, is who would take on the case, has said that appeals from the PUC on policy, the, P, the Supreme Court will not overrule the PUC on policy, but they will overrule the PUC, or they can overrule the PUC on procedure. Has the PUC dotted all their I's? Have they crossed all their T's? And Next Era has appealed in other states, other jurisdictions. They have turned to the courts. And other companies involved in mergers do turn to the courts. Mergers across the country are phenomenal, with half of them failing. And those that succeed sometimes rupture. So it's an extremely complex issue. 
And right now, NextEra is seeking to buy Hawaiian Electric for $4.3 billion while they're seeking to buy Encore Transmission in Texas for $18 billion. So we have a total free-for-all coming. And with that, Marco, carry it away. take it away. <laughs>